heartfelt appreciation and thanks very much. Michael Hayes. I'm sorry, what? Sledgehammer. That's Sledgehammer, Peter Gabriel, right? Yeah. yeah. I grew up in the 80s, I, I know that. Or was it the late 80s? I don't know. Anyways, so my job today is to recap yesterday. Um, Josh asked me to kind of think about um, what all we learned and uh, to recap the day and to start off and kick off today. And as I talked to a lot of you, it turns out that you enjoyed my Disney stories more than my content is what I found out. So, um, which by the way, somebody asked me how many turkey legs were, you know, are eaten in a year, because there's some large number. If you've ever eaten turkey at the Disney theme park, it's really, really good. I actually haven't, but supposedly it's very, very good. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know that 300,000 pounds of popcorn is sold every year. And speaking of photos, the, the number one most photographed place in America as a tourist destination is in the front of the Mickey Mouse planner where the steam trains are in the main gate, if you know where that is. So uh, there's some more Disney trivia for you. So anyways, um, to recap yesterday, really I think we learned three main things. The first thing, at least my takeaways, was number one was that television, as a, you know, as in a traditional sense, is much, much different than digital video across screens. We heard a lot of that in terms of how the programming is done with ESPN, uh, ABC, and others. Which brings me to number two, that the programming, as well as you could argue the advertising across screens, is fundamentally different than what we've experienced traditionally in media and advertising. And the 22 Squared guys, I thought, did a really nice job of showing us a lot of creative. But certainly that came to life, too, when we interviewed um, uh, Mr. King from, uh, from ESPN. And then finally, I think was uh, clear to everyone in the room was that measurement is a big, big piece. Uh, Adam, I thought, did a nice job um, from ABC talking about that sellers and buyers can value the media differently. Um, that's fine, but certainly, as all of you know, there's a big thirst in the audience as well as in the industry for a universal metric to get dollars to shift, possibly, if that's appropriate for the advertiser. But we also learned that that universal metric is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And so um, I'm sure that we'll hear more from a measurement standpoint, not only throughout today, but at other industry events, as well as we kind of struggle and work our way through that as an industry. So with that, um, our next guest um, is Kevin Conroy from Univision. And before we bring Kevin up, uh, a couple key notes. Um, First off, Univision has done a really, really nice job. Their ratings are larger than NBC right now, which is a big, uh, a big feather in their cap. And we have a short video to show you before we bring Kevin up. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. How we watch and what we watch is all changing dramatically. There's Hulu Plus, Netflix. Computers, tablets. There are iPhones, iPads. It's a big initiative within the cable industry. They call it TV everywhere. We've officially become a multi-screen culture. The nation's Hispanic population is exploding. They make up nearly 17% of the population. And those numbers are expected to grow. A marketing executive's dream. And that is creating another boom in Hispanic media. Univision already commands about three quarters of the Spanish speaking television audience in the U.S. Are you ready? Ooh, are you ready for the day? They began to whip up bigger ambitions. With all due respect, but you didn't keep that from. Well, here, here's what I would say. You want to be able to reach them where they are. Ubideos is Univision in your hands. Welcome to Ubideos. His 
Historically, Univision was Spanish only. That's beginning to change. ABC News is about to join forces with Univision. This is uncharted territory. Ahora soy Andrés Duarte. A huge market. Hispanics now look less like a niche market and more like the future. Simple and as bold as that. Powerful, huh? So let's uh, let's welcome Kevin up to the stage. My water just fell. Sorry. And Kevin, yeah, thank you for saving me. Kevin is the president of Digital and Enterprise Development. That's a big title. You're going to have to tell us a little bit about that. Um, and you launched the first bilingual network, I think, in 2012. Is that right? Uh, first fully bilingual network. That's right. First of all, good morning. Um, and I can tell you that I can vouch for the turkey legs in Frontierland. <laughs> That's right. So tell, us, so tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do at Univision, and certainly with all this growth, there must be tremendous challenges internally. What do you face on a daily basis when you think about Univision and your role? Well, so I, I, um, uh, I've been in the media business for, um, for a number of years, um, and uh, all of which was in English language media before four years ago. Um, the music business, the television business, um, and then AOL for a number of years before, before joining Univision. And my primary um, goal in joining Univision was that I really wanted to be back in what I thought and felt would be a natural growth opportunity. Um, and it's been, it's been that uh, and, and more. And I would say that the, there's a lot to be said from uh, learning from experience. And I was in the music business in the, uh, in the late 90s, and there was a, an awful lot to learn during that period as it now relates to everything that other forms of media um, have been going through. And so when I joined the company, you know, my, my, my focus uh, has been and continues to be digital. I've taken on some additional responsibility in the time that I've been there. But, you know, it's really uh, been all about trying to be in sync with the market and make every effort to get out ahead of what we expect to be, um, you know, the, some, some pretty strong dynamics that are obviously affecting the business. And I think it's important to point out that, you know, Univision is actually uh, one of the few media brands who, in, even in today's current environment, could have taken the view that, um, that we'll wait, a, we'll wait a little longer and let this play out a little bit. And the reason I say that is because um, where, where time shifting has affected uh, most other media companies in a, already in a pretty dramatic way, I think, um, uh, I think live viewing for the big four English language networks is somewhere in the 60s. Live viewing for us is still 92%. Um, and, and so one could have taken the view that at 92% live viewing, time shifting is affecting us a little bit less, so let's, let's wait a little while and see how this plays out. And in fact, we took the opposite view. Uh, and the view was that, that that's exactly the time to be trying to build out uh, our ability to offer uh, new offerings in the marketplace, both on television. We now have um, 12 networks to broadcast um, and the balance cable, uh, 69 radio stations, 62 television stations. And our, and, our, and our digital footprint um, has, has grown quite significantly over the last four years, uh, including uh, Ubedeos most recently six months ago. Um, so all of that has been an attempt to take the view that, um, that really, and this has been a little bit counter to market, I meaning if you go back 10 years, uh, where lots of people, there was a pretty strong school of thought that with the advent of technology and on demand, et cetera, that, uh, that brand, brands would matter less. Um, and there were an awful lot of folks uh, who wrote about that and talked about that, et cetera. And, um, and, and I've maintained consistently that no, brands actually matter more. Because in an increasingly fragmented environment, um, consumers are going to be looking to brands to help get through the clutter and associate those brands with things that, that, that they're familiar with, that they like, et cetera. And that's, that's a, that's a really very strong advantage for Univision. Uh, we, 
we enjoy uh, a very unique relationship with our, with our audience. Um, and, and I think the combination of those things, a, a, a unique, unique relationship, a, a very strong, deep connection to what is, in fact, the youngest and fastest growing community in the United States, um, and, and then the ability to build out platforms in our, our view is that we want to have a, a Univision branded content experience in front of our audience everywhere that they are, e even if possible before they get there. And in doing that, uh, we, we believe that, that that footprint becomes so important because we don't want to be chasing our audience. We want to, in fact, be there as they go there. Right. So that's, 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 that's significant because typically, uh, you know, you hear in the industry that brand doesn't matter. I, I agree with you that, that on, at least in the television networks, that people are more associated with the shows and the programming than they are actually with the network. Do you think, why is that different for Univision? Well, um, or, or, or is that not true? No, I, I, I think it is true. I, I think there are some exceptions, in fairness. Um, there, are, there, there are often, as there are exceptions to, to these rules, but I think Univision behaves more like a consumer brand than a traditional media brand. Um, you know, it's 50 year relationship with its audience. Um, and uh, as I said, an increasingly you know, younger and younger audience has al allowed Univision to really deliver a value proposition that just wasn't available anywhere else for the longest time. And, and that enabled the company to develop a, a, real, a really strong affinity. Um, in fact, fairly recently, you know, we did a, a, a Burke study, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Burke, the tracks brands, et cetera, um, and, uh, and they had never seen a score as high as Univision's, uh, obviously among Hispanics, um, ranked up in, in, in the crowd of you know, Apple and Coca-Cola, et cetera. Um, and and so, the, so it's very real. I mean, that, that relationship is very real. And I think that the company, uh, long before I joined, um, people have made a series of very conscious decisions over the course of many years uh, to, to really focus on, on the audience and serve the audience, and serve the audience not only in the form of information, entertainment, um, et cetera, but serve the audience more broadly. And so there's a, a, a very strong commitment to the community, um, and, and, and that's allowed the, the company to, to evolve into actually solving real problems. And what I mean by that is, um, adjacent to our media business, there are some real issues that affect Hispanics in the United States in terms of access to financial products, um, health care, et cetera. And you know, we've developed a, a Univision uh, series of financial products, prepaid card, et cetera, Univision Pharmacia program that's honored at 20,000 uh, pharmacies in the United States and Puerto Rico um, that provides discounts on medicines. So our value proposition is anchored in information, the news, and entertainment, um, but we've bridged beyond that, and, and we've made we've really created very deep relationships with our audience in the local community. So you mentioned your digital platforms and how that's <coughs> grown in, in, in a very short order. Um, why are Hispanics really prime for a multi-screen or a multi-platform strategy? Well, the, uh, as the data shows, Hispanics um, uh, tend to over-index uh, in, in most forms of, of technology, notably, notably mobile. Um, and uh, and we, we see this uh, bear itself out. I mean, to, at, at this point, you compare you know, Hispanics with non-Hispanics. I think the, the numbers are along the lines of Hispanics. About 70% of Hispanics have smartphones, not just mobile phones, smartphones. And of the 70%, 40%, um, are actively consuming video on those devices. And so those numbers are considerably higher uh, than, than what you see on the non-Hispanic side. I think so, some of that has to do with the, I think um, uh, the, uh, the, some of that has to do with the age, the youthfulness. I mean, on average, Hispanics, I think, relative to the general population are about 10 years younger. Um, and, uh, and I think the numbers are, you know, by 2022, 26% um, of teens 12 to 17 will be Hispanic, 23% of adults 18 to 34 will be Hispanic. So clearly the trends uh, are, are moving in a direction that, 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 that really provides access to a younger and younger population that is by definition very connected socially. I mean the other statistic that really jumped out to me was um, 
was I think that uh, I think Hispanics are about 40% more likely to be engaging in social media on a mobile device. Um, that seemed like that seemed quite significant to me. How is Univision leveraging that social connectedness? Um, you know, for all of your programming and across devices, are you doing anything special there? Um, well, we've we've been very focused on it. For I mean, when I again when I when I joined about four years ago, the company had already built out. Um, uh, at scale, you know, an online, a traditional web, imagine we're using the word traditional before web, um, traditional web experience, but hadn't really focused a lot on mobile. And so our primary focus over the past four years has been mobile and social. Um, and we've built out, you know, pretty large footprints in both of those areas. I think we have along the lines of about 8 million um, fans and followers, and we've really embedded social, and I don't mean just social in terms of Facebook and Twitter, but more, more recently, the construct of social TV, which is, I think is a, f a much more interesting way to think about social. I don't think, I, I don't think it's the activity around the programming that, it, that is as meaningful as it is engaging audiences with the programming and creating extensions of the programming and adjacencies, et cetera, which is really what social TV um, enables us to do. And so that ability to sync with the experience, with the linear experience, and build, build a bridge between linear and digital, I think is really powerful. So we have a lot of advertisers in the audience today, a lot of brands. Uh, what advice would you give them, not only in terms of advertising um, in, to the Hispanic <coughs> community, but also, why hasn't there been a bigger investment, given their buying power, given their uh, adoption rates of mobile and other digital platforms? What's your point of view on that? Well, I think, uh, I, think that, I think it's a combination of, um, of, of perhaps either some combination of misunderstanding and or of lack of understanding. And I can fully appreciate why for some period of years people um, you know, used the word niche when they were describing or talking about to any extent um, the Hispanic opportunity in the United States. Uh, I would just offer that at, at 17 percent of the population, you know, going quickly to 1922 and then will double, you know, by 2050. And the characteristics I mentioned earlier, younger, um, et cetera, you know, I, I, I look at it and think it, it's something that really deserves to be reconsidered. Uh, and I think now is the time to reconsider it. And so it really isn't so much, uh, you know, how we got here. I think it's more to do with where is the market today where is, where is the market going? And, and for any marketer who's interested in growth, um, you know, you, you really, I, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how you look past this. I mean, I'd say it, it's no longer an opportunity. I look at it really as an imperative, which is why I actually made a career decision to leave, you know, English language media to be a part of something that I thought was the future of media. I mean, it, it, to my knowledge, there's no natural growth occurring in English language media. There's natural growth occurring in, um, in, in Spanish language media and in the Hispanic market more broadly, because I think it's important to acknowledge that when we talk about Hispanic, we're really referring to Spanish dominant bi and bilingual. Um, and I, I think that's another important part of what we as a company are focused on, which is looking holistically at the opportunity. And so I'd say to a marketer, I, I, think, I think it's time to, to reconsider. Um, my view is that now I think what was an opportunity or what is an opportunity needs to be thought of more as a business imperative. Um, that if you're looking for growth of brand, product, et cetera, I'm not sure how you look past 17% of the population growing to 30. Um, and the characteristics of the audience, meaning you know, on average 10 years younger, et cetera, is, is really a fantastic opportunity for brands because you really want to lock people in when they're younger to be able to then grow and maintain loyalty over time. Um, and there's also something unique uh, about Hispanics that's, that's borne out in research, which is, which is that they tend to be much more brand loyal and much more engaged with brands. And so another interesting statistic is that Hispanics are 25% more likely to follow a brand in social media. You know, that's a meaningful number. It's not three or four, it's 25%. Wow. 
So give us a sense, uh, uh, like I mentioned, what advice would you give the audience in terms of marketing to Hispanics across these devices as you think about digital video? Uh, you mentioned two <coughs> segments. You mentioned uh, you know, Spanish in language as well as bilingual. Um, how does how, how do adver what's how how best should advertisers scale to that? Well, I, I think the core principle has to be around cultural relevancy, um, uh, you know, really language fluency, if you will, and it's it's uh, or cultural fluency, if you will, because uh, I think I think some people get a little bit hung up on on language, um, and, and language matters because the reality is that seventy five percent of Hispanics in the United States speak Spanish at home. But it shouldn't be the only defining uh, criteria because the reality is that cultural relevance and cultural fluency um, is, is, is terribly important as it relates to the kind of content experiences that Hispanics can, re can, can relate to in, in programming. And so some of the mistakes that people make are fairly obvious ones, you know, selecting a, or casting a, 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 a Latina actress does not make a, pro a program culturally relevant, right? Um, and so I, I would argue that, uh, to answer your question, I'd say the most important thing is really is, is looking through the lens of, of, of relevancy and fluency, but not just about language, um, and be much more holistic about how we look at how we're engaging audiences. And, but I would argue that that point's not specific to Hispanic. I think that point is, is really specific to how we think about media consumption going forward and how we as an industry, frankly, wrap ourselves around, and you touched upon measurement, and we don't have to go there right this second, but you can't have the conversation without at least spending some, some portion of time there. Um, I, my, my perspective is that these platforms have grown up much too independently. Um, and, and that each platform has, uh, ha has afforded new opportunities to engage audiences um, incrementally, but, but, but we haven't actually, I don't think, done a good enough job looking at how audiences are behaving holistically and the fluid ways in which people are living their lives. Um, people don't do just one thing, uh, and, and so as the, as the digital industry has grown up, as the digital economy has continued to evolve, I think there's a little bit been too much about, first it was online, then it was mobile, how do these things fit together, now you have other devices, new platforms, and, and, and we're almost starting from scratch every, every time there's a new platform, um, and I think, that's, um, I think that's a big mistake, because um, the reality is that that's not how people are living their lives. They're living their lives much more fluidly, and you know, we've debated for some time you know, is it two screens? Is it three screens, et cetera? And, and this is only one person's opinion. I think we've landed on the five screens that matter for the next 20 years. Um, and I think that, that traditional web will continue to play a role, and by that I don't distinguish between desktop and laptop. Um, smartphones, number two. Tablets, again, I don't, disc I don't disc uh, discern between full size and mini. Um, uh, I would say four is connected devices, of which there are a range of connected devices. It could be my, my new um, you know, Samsung 8000, or it could be Xbox. They're both connected devices. And, and finally, something that I think will get an increasing amount of attention over the course of the next, call it four or five years, which is that cars are now a legitimate fifth platform, which will scale fast because you know, the turnover cycle I think historically has been in the seven, eight year range. It, it pushed up to about 10 or 11, largely driven by the economy in recent years, but it's coming back down fast. Um, and anyone who spent any time at CES this year, um, that was not a whiteboard exercise. You know, that's, that's real. Um, and I think, that, I think that information, news, content being consumed via IP in, in automobiles is a legitimate fifth platform. And, and to my, really, my point is that when you think across those platforms, every one of those platforms cannot have their own set of benchmarks. They can't have their own discrete set of metrics. They can't you know, have their own platform-specific forms of measurement. We need to step back and look holistically that at the end of the day, we're trying to reach and engage audiences. And I would argue that beyond reach and frequency, 
the metric that matters most is engagement, and that ultimately engagement is, is I think, going to be the thing, the difference, there are differences that don't make a difference, and there are differences that do make a difference, and I think that's one. So I'm gonna ask one more question, and then we'll leave some time for the audience to answer uh, or ask some questions. Uh, yesterday we saw, I presented a slide that said uh, Wired claimed that machinima is the future of television, as it was a recent Wired article. What do you believe the future of television is, uh, given your music background and what have you? All right, so I smile. Um, I'm giving you one minute, yeah, by the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> because I, you know, I, uh, so I've known Alan for many years, I really like, really like what they're doing, but I, I would just caution um, anyone from saying that that this is the thing. You know, there was a day, some may or may not remember, there was a day when mp3.com was the future of the music business. There was another day when Napster was the future of the music business. There was another day when Nutella was the future of the music business, et, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I, I would say that there are some really interesting new models. Um, uh, uh, Machinima is one, Me Too is another. They're a little different, frankly. They're at different ends of the spectrum. One's more of a distribution play. One's more of a content curation play. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think it's any one thing. I think the, I think our media industry is evolving at such a rapid rate. And what I, what I love the most is that it's blending. Um, and I think it's in the blendedness that is, is where the richness of the opportunity comes in. And I think, I think traditional forms of media can learn substantially from, from newer forms of media and vice versa. Um, and in my experience, the answer is usually somewhere in the middle, not at the extremes. Um, and so I think we still have several rounds to go. Um, I'm hugely excited about where the digital video economy is, um, but I, I, I would argue that, uh, that it's still early, and the good news is there are lots of p smart people that are really, you know, f focused on it, and uh, and I think that the I think that the the content side of it is in pretty good shape and getting better every day. The distribution piece of it um, is is scaling nicely, and and I'd say you know now it's it's much more about how we go about developing you know newer forms of of uh, audience delivery that really effectively deliver for marketers against their objectives, and there is no one set of objectives because each marketer has their own set of objectives, and I think that's an important part of the consideration. And, and I would just reiterate that I think on the measurement side, um, that in order, to, in order to scale, in order to be successful, measurement needs to be much more holistic. Great, so we're gonna open up to the audience for questions, any questions? I think there's a mic. Uh, uh, hi, thanks. Really interesting. Could could you perhaps just tell what what are you working on right now, and what what keeps you up what keeps you up all uh, at night? Um, the the operational complexity. I mean, there are some strategic issues, but the it really has more to do with the operational complexity around how we deliver um, messaging and, and engagement uh, across the various platforms and and in a way that kind of lines up with, with where we know the audiences are. So, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, just at a time when, uh, when, when we, as an industry, we're getting, I think, pretty good at, at how we went about delivering audiences to traditional web, the audience, audience moved rapidly, you know, to, to mobile, to social, and now, you know, we're wrestling with issues of, of, I think, delivery, improving the value of those platforms in a, in a way that actually enables the economy around, around those platforms to start to, 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 to move appropriately. And there are lots of, there's, just, there's a lot of operational complexity. I mean, I remember, again, you know, being at AOL for a number of years, I, I remember the complexity that we faced in dealing with all the different desktop configurations um, uh, you know, from, a, from a technology perspective. And, and the complexities around mobile and the newer platforms, you know, make, make traditional online, you know, look relatively simple in, in hindsight. Of course, at the time, it was daunting, right? Quality control and QA and whatever. Um, so it's, most of the issues now, in, you know, the things that I really worry about, you know, before I join you this morning and when I leave here, uh, have to do with how quickly we can scale uh, on the operational side, because today we're dealing with lots of third parties, 
um, which raises you know lot, lots of tough tough issues. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Is that fair, Jeff? Yeah. In the back. Good morning. It's it's great to have you here. I'm excited. I um, probably watch too much Univision uh, for my my wife's taste, and it's you can't exhibited. watch too much. You can't watch too much. Oh right, that's a good point. My my 18 month old son knows uh, who Don Francisco is more than his own grandmother. <laughs> so He's a wonderful man. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we work with our clients, um, and we'd like to to do more buys with Univision. One of the, the reservations that we come up uh, come across a lot is is that the the numbers for the younger generation adopting the technologies just isn't as um, much as the overall market. Uh, what would you say to that, or how would you help us to better justify a buy for Univision, considering that? Uh, even though the growth is so much, the adoption may not be as much as the general market. Um, actually, it's it's quite the opposite. Uh, if you if you look at the at various forms of data, uh, uh, Hispanics over-index on technology using vis-a-vis uh, -vis non Hispanics dramatically. I'll use mobile just as an example. So, of the 12 or 14 characteristics that define mobile. And by, by that, I mean everything from making a phone call, text messaging, watching video, surfing the web, et cetera. Um, on 12 of those 14 you know, ca characteristics, Hispanics over-index by a wide margin vis-a-vis non-Hispanics. And I, I don't mean 101. I mean like 131. So, uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to follow up with you. The, there's a lot of data to support that that the younger audience uh, is actually, that Hispanics are way more engaged with, uh, with technology. I mentioned earlier, you know, 70% of Hispanics you know, have smartphones, which is considerably higher than the general population. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to have that, that data that will help us. Thank you. Happy to do it. Uh, we actually do have one, one uh, time for one more question, probably. Uh, that went faster than I anticipated. Uh, any other questions? I, I, yeah. Hi, Kevin. Th Hi. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for um, inviting me. You got it. Uh, uh, we hope you come back. Um, quick question is about, um, you know, with Hispanics being really involved in social media, how closely are you guys watching uh, Twitter chatter and social media, and how, how are you kind of gauging it, you know, the, the acquisition of Bluefin and all of that data available to you? You know, wh what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so my, my perspective is that, um, you know, social media, before it was called social media, actually kind of grew up in things like forums and chat rooms, right? Um, that's, that was social media before we called it social media. And so our monitoring of social media actually began years ago, uh, and, that, and that was engaging it with, with moderation and really understanding what were the topics, what were the concerns, what were the issues, what were people talking about, and what did they care about? And that, ha that, that impacted you know, news coverage, information that we felt was needed and, and wanted to be consumed, and, and helped to shape you know, entertainment. We've carried that, that discipline and sort of doubled down, if you will, um, with, with the advent of you know, defined social media. And so we, we have a team that's very actively engaged in not only con using social media to create engagement with our programming, um, and, and digital has absolutely shaped how we approach linear programming, um, but also use that data to actually monitor in real time what's happening on a show and what's, what our audience is responding to. So, so we have, we have you know, like what we call a social media jockey in the master control room of our linear broadcast that's monitoring in real time how social, how social uh, audiences, audiences on social are responding to what's on air that's actually shaping um, what we do from a programming perspective. Social media jockey, remember that term. <laughs> They've added time for us, I think. Is that correct? No? Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. Thank uh, you, I Michael. appreciate it. Um, a big round of applause for Kevin Conroy of Univision.